So, you know, if your kidneys are failing, I want to say, you're in trouble. <laughs> See what I did there? You're in trouble. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's Ryan here. I hope you're well. <clears throat> you know, uh, recently we received some bad news that the proverbial queen of rock and roll, this Tina Turner, has passed away. She gave us hits like, You're simply the best. Da -da -da -da. And what about, what's love got to do, got to do with it? So, so we must be so rest in peace. Anyway, today we're talking about acute kidney injury. Aki? No, Aki. Acute kidney injury. So our outline is we're going to be covering a clinical case, then looking at acute kidney injury in the way of an introduction, and then delving into the uh, truckload of etiologies, uh, looking at patient presentation with signs and symptoms, Differential diagnosis, <clears throat> diagnostic evaluation, treatment and management, prognosis and complications. Then we're going to be looking at the Bible. Thanks so much for joining me. Hope you and your family are well. Okay, guys, let's get started. So we've got a 54-year-old man who is admitted to the medical ICU with sepsis associated with pneumococcal pneumonia. He requires mechanical ventilation as well as adrenaline to maintain a mean arterial pressure. That's a MAP of above 60 mils mercury. Invasive hemodynamics shows adequate left heart filling pressures. He is not known to have left ventricular dysfunction. Very good. On the third hospital day, his urine output drops and his creatinine increases to a whopping 220 micromol per liter. Uh, acute tubular injury is diagnosed. Now, which of the following agents has been shown to improve outcomes associated with acute tubular injury? Is it furosemide, option A? Is it B, bosentin? C, low-dose dopamine, C, insulin-like growth factor, or is it E, none of the above? Hmm, nice to ask, isn't it? So guys, acute kidney injury has been defined by consensus as the abrupt development of functional or structural abnormalities of the kidneys. Diagnostic criteria include a sudden, right, so within 48 hours, reduction in kidney function defined as an increase in serum creatinine of at least 50% in comparison with baseline or a reduction in urine output to below 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for more than six hours. It may result in accumulation of our beloved nitrogenous wastes, which is a term we affectionately call azotemia, right? So this azotemia, as well as altered electrolyte, acid base, and fluid balance. Now, AKI results in approximately 1% of all hospital admissions, yet occurs in about 10% of general inpatients and 20% of patients admitted to the ICU. So, by and large, guys, the etiology of acute kidney injury can be substratified into pre-renal, which is by and large the most common uh, cause we see in clinical practice. Then you've got intrinsic renal causes, which are specific to the kidneys themselves, and then we've got post-renal causes. Right? We'll be looking at a table. Right? So this is a beautiful algorithm from Harrison's illustrating the main causes behind acute kidney injury. So let's get in there. So we said it's either pre-renal, Right, intrinsic renal or post renal. Examples of pre renal uh, AKI are hypovolemia from whatever cause, usually dehydration on the back of uh, you know, uh, diarrhea or some losses uh, or, or bleeding, you know, a decreased cardiac output, decreased effective circulating volume in the way of congestive cardiac failure or liver failure, impaired renal autoregulation, and the poster kits for that is the use of non steroidals. And we know non steroidals are going to inhibit prostaglandin, so you get afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction, afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction, and that diminishes your glomerular filtration rate. ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, they cause efferent arteriolar vasodilation. And so that also diminishes your GFR, cyclosporin as well. Guys, causes of intrinsic AKI, we look at glomerular causes, tubular causes, and vascular causes. So among the glomerular causes is acute glomerular nephritis. If are looking at the tubules and interstitium, there we speak to ischemia, right? So acute tubular necrosis sepsis or infection, and of course, nephrotoxins. Nephrotoxins can be subdivided into exogenous and endogenous. Exogenous being things like iodinated contrast, aminoglycosides, cisplatin, amphotericin B, which is what we use in cryptococcal meningitis, proton pump inhibitors, and non -steroidals. So non can cause pre-renal as well as intrinsic, uh, you know, uh, AKI. Then endogenous causes the likes of hemolysis, rhabdomolysis, myeloma, kidney, Intratubular crystals, all right? Vascular causes of intrinsic AKI include vasculitis, malignant hypertension, and everybody's favorite, 
thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura with hemolytic edemic syndrome, TTP HAS. Then post renal causes of AKI guys has to do with bladder outlet obstruction or bilateral pelvo ureteral obstruction or unilateral obstruction of a solitary functioning kidney. Alrighty. I just want to draw attention, guys, to the fact that the SI units that we use here in South Africa differs from that which is used in the States. Now, we may be reading some textbooks which are written in the United States. So I just want to bear uh, or pay closer attention to this fact that uh, in the States, they measure the urea in milligrams per deciliter, which is what they call the blood urea nitrogen. And a normal urea is between 7 to 30 milligrams per deciliter, but we use SI units, which is in millimol per liter, and a normal urea uh, concentration is 2.5 to 10.7 millimol per liter. Normal creatinine uh, <coughs> in the US units, which is milligram per deciliter, is 0.7 to 1.2 milligram per deciliter, but a normal creatinine for us in micromol per liter is between 62 to 106. So when we define pre-renal azotemia, Right, or pre-renal causes of AKI, we look at the urea to creatinine ratio, right? which in the American SI unit would be a ratio of greater than 20 is to 1. But in our SI unit, based on the uh, millimol per liter and micromol per liter system, we look for a urea to creatinine ratio of greater than 100 is to 1. Right? If you're looking at normal or post-renal AKI, then the urea to creatinine ratio in our unit is 40 to 100 is to 1. Intrinsic renal failure, you look for a urea to creatinine ratio of below 40 is to 1. Alrighty. Okay, guys. So these are the other tests we can do to distinguish uh, pre-renal from intrinsic renal uh, uh, AKI. Right? So urea to creatinine ratio, like we said, uh, which we already mentioned. Okay, then you can look at your urine sodium, which is very low in pre-renal failure because the kidneys are trying to conserve your sodium, right? So the kidneys are functional. So urine sodium of less than 20. But if it's intrinsic renal cause, then the urine sodium is above 40 because you're losing sodium in the urine. Your urine osmolality in pre-renal AKI is above 500, but the urine osmo in renal AKI is less than 350. If you look at the specific gravity of urine in pre-renal AKI, it's above 1.020, but the specific gravity in intrinsic renal AKI is less than 1.010. If you look at the fractional excretion of sodium, we're going to be talking about this later. Fractional excretion of sodium right, in pre-renal failure is less than 1%, but in intrinsic renal is above 2%. And if you look at your urinalysis, in pre-renal AKI, you're going to find uh, a normal uh, urine, or you may have higher line casts. But in intrinsic renal failure, you're going to find granular casts together with tubular epithelial cells. So guys, how do patients with AKI present? Presentation, by and large, depends on the severity of the renal dysfunction. Mild cases may be absolutely asymptomatic. <coughs> Excuse me. So acute kidney injury can be superimposed on chronic kidney disease, something we call acute on chronic kidney disease. Urine output may be decreased, but AKI can occur without a noticeable drop in the urine output. There may be signs of volume overload, like pulmonary and or peripheral edema, together with a raised jugular venous pressure. You may have uremic symptoms, which are rather nonspecific and include things like fatigue, nausea, vomiting, weakness, confusion, and lethargy. Uremic signs include things like asterixis, which is the infamous flapping tremor, right? dry, flaky skin, and a pericardial friction rub because of uremic pericarditis. Right? Gastrointestinal bleeding, owing to uh, you know, qualitative plated dysfunction, and malnutrition may also be present. Okay? So this is a beautiful table from Harrison's illustrating the major causes, uh, clinical features, and diagnostic studies of pre-renal and intrinsic AKI. So if the etiology is pre-renal azotemia, the clinical features are those that we just mentioned, right? History of poor fluid intake or fluid loss. And then we have hemorrhage, diarrhea, vomiting, sequestration, use of non steroidals ACE inhibitors, heart failure, evidence of volume depletion, right? And decreased effective circulatory uh, volume. The lab features we've already been through, already. But if you're looking at sepsis-associated uh, acute kidney injury, then obviously the patient will have sepsis. We'll have a septic syndrome or in septic shock. We'll have overt hypotension, all right? And lab features would be a positive culture from a normally sterile body fluid or any other test confirming infection. Urine sediment often contains granular casts and renal tubular epithelial cell casts. The fractional excretion of sodium may be low, below 1%, particularly early on, but it's usually above 1% with the osmolality 
below 500 osmoles per kg. Then in ischemic associated AKI, the patient will have systemic hypotension, often superimposed on sepsis, or for reasons of limited renal reserve, such as the older patients and those with CKD, right? And in terms of lab features, in ischemia associated AKI, the urine sediment often contains granular casts, renal tubular epithelial cell casts, and the phenol is typically above 1%. Nephrotoxin associated AKI represents an endogenous cause of AKI, and the poster kits for that is rhabdomonosis, hemolysis, tumor lysis, and multiple myeloma. Nephrotoxin associated AKI are exogenous causes like contrast nephropathy and tubular injury, right? And the other causes of intrinsic AKI include glomerular nephritis and vasculitis, interstitial nephritis, TTP, atheroembolic disease, and post renal acute kidney injury, already. Guys, this is a beautiful diagram, once again, from Harrison's, which demonstrates the internal or the intrarenal mechanisms for auto-regulation of glomerular filtration rate under conditions of diminished perfusion pressure and reduction of the GFR by drugs. So this is the normal situation, right? I've got a beautiful glomerulus here, affluent arterial coming in, giving rise to the glomerulus and the affluent arterial leaving. So what maintains affluent arteriola uh, dilation is your prostaglandins, alrighty? What maintains effluent arteriolar vasoconstriction is angiotensin 2, alright? So here we have a situation where there's diminished perfusion pressure for whatever reason. This is then sensed by the uh, duxal glomerular cells in the macula densa, right? and that then leads to afferent arteriolar vasodilation and effluent arteriolar vasoconstriction mediated by your vasodilatory prostaglandins at the effluent arteriole and your increased angiotensin 2 at the effluent arteriole to maintain your filtration pressure, right? When we use non-steroidals, non-steroidals inhibit prostaglandins, right? So that's going to result in affluent arteriolar vasoconstriction and your glomerular filtration rate drops, not good. If you use too much of ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers, right? <coughs> Excuse me, that's going to cause effluent arteriolar vasoconstriction. Or rather, it's going to cause, uh, I beg your pardon, effluent arteriolar vasodilation because you're inhibiting angiotensin 2 uh, that also drops your glomerular filtration rate. So, below a certain threshold, the use of ACE inhibitors is actually deleterious to your glomerular filtration rate. Okay, this is another way of looking at the major causes of intrinsic acute kidney injury, right? So this is a beautiful nephron here, right? So we've got the cortex and the medulla, and the medulla is split into the outer and inner sections, right? So here we can see the proximal convolution tubule, and from there you go into the pars recta and then the loop of Henle, which is divided into your thin descending, your thin ascending, and your thick ascending limb. And eventually that gives rise to your distal convoluted tubule, all right, uh, and thereafter the collecting tubule and the collecting duct. So here we can see a nephron which goes all the way down to the inner medulla, and here we see one which is more like a cortical nephron which hangs around in the cortex in the outer medulla. All right, so causes of intrinsic AKI can be subpartitioned into vascular causes, uh, and that can be further stratified into small vessel and large vessel, that which affects the tubules, that which are intratubular, and those affecting the interstitium. So small vessel causes are things like glomerular nephritis, vasculitis, TTP, disseminated intravascular coagulation, atheroemboli, malignant hypertension, sepsis, and calcineurin inhibitors. Now, that which affects the large vessels includes things like renal artery embolus, dissection, and vasculitis, renal vein thrombus. Watch out for this in the setting of nephrotic syndrome, because in nephrotic syndrome, that is a hypercoagulable state because you are peeing out your protein CNS, which pushes you towards a prothrombotic state, and uh, a hallmark of one of the complications of nephrotic syndrome is renal vein thrombus. The patient complains of flank pain, and you do a, 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 a renal venogram, and you find that they have a big old thrombus sitting in there. Right, abdominal compartment syndrome is the other. Tubular causes of intrinsic AKI include toxic acute tubular necrosis, and we spoke about these, the endogenous causes and the exogenous causes, and the ischemic ATN and the sepsis related. Then we've got the intratubular causes, once again, endogenous, exogenous, uh, endogenous being myeloma and uric acid from tumor lysis syndrome and cellular debris, and exogenous being things like acyclovir, methotrexate. Those which affect the interstitium, by and large, are allergic, like allergic reactions to penicillin and PPIs and non -steroidals. infectious causes on the back of severe pyelonephritis, legionella and sepsis, infiltration in the way of lymphoma and leukemia, inflammatory causes like Sjogren's, tubular interstitial nephritis and sepsis already. 
Guys, just quickly looking at the pathophysiology of ischemic acute renal failure, right? We got microvascular reasons and tubular reasons, and the microvascular reasons have to do with glomerular and medullary mechanisms, right? So the reason why you have uh, ischemic acute renal failure and diminished oxygen to the tubules, right? So what happens is that we're going to have increased vasoconstriction in response to endothelin, adenosine, angiotensin 2, thromboxin A2. All of these are very potent vasoconstrictors. We have diminished vasodilatation in response to nitric oxide, right? And, uh, well, diminished nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So it's because it's diminished, you can have diminished vasodilation, right? Increased endothelial and vascular smooth muscle cell structural damage and raised leukocyte endothelial adhesion, vascular obstruction, leukocyte activation and inflammation. At the same time, on the tubular side, we have cytoskeletal breakdown, mitochondrial injury, loss of polarity, apoptosis and necrosis, disquamation of viable and necrotic cells, tubular obstruction, and back leak, right? And that actually drives the inflammatory and vasoactive mediators, which drives the AKI, okay? Here, taking a closer look at our post-renal etiologies behind AKI, so it's a beautiful diagram showing us, basically, the genital urinary system. So we've got the kidneys, we've got bilateral ureters moving to the bladder, and then we've got the urethra and out the body, right? So that which impacts the level of the kidneys, especially the calyx and the ureters, are things like stones, blood clots, external compression, tumor, retroperitoneal fibrosis. That which acts at the level of the bladder and the urethra includes prostatic enlargement, blood clots, and cancer. At the level of the urethra, we have strictures or an obstructed Foley's catheter. Guys, what are the different kinds of urinary sediment that we expect in the setting of AKI that can kind of help to substratify our different etiologies? So looking at the urine sediment, it can be normal or we have few red blood cells or white cells or hyaline casts. And that's a situation with pre-renal, post-renal causes, arterial thrombosis or embolism, preglomerular vasculitis, HUS, TTP, steroderma crisis. But if by and large the urine sediment is abnormal, and if we see red cells or red cell cast, you must think glomerular nephritis, right? That's the main one. Together with possible vasculitis, malignant hypertension, thrombotic microangiopathy, TTP. If there's white cells or white cell cast in the urine sediment, you think about interstitial nephritis, glomerular nephritis, pyelonephritis, allograft rejection, or malignant infiltration of the kidney. If there's renal tubular epithelial cells or renal tubular epithelial casts or pigmented casts, you think about acute tubular necrosis, tubular interstitial nephritis, acute cellular allograft rejection, myoglobinuria, hemoglobinuria. If there's a good old granular cast, you think about ATN, glomerular nephritis, vasculitis, tubular interstitial nephritis. If there's eosinophiluria, that's a big clue to allergic interstitial nephritis. Yes, a thoracic disease as well. Pyelonephritis as well as cystitis, glomerulonephritis. If there's crystals in the urine, you think about acute uric acid nephropathy, calcium oxalate crystal, that happens with brake fluid ingestion, which is ethylene glycol intoxication, and drugs and toxins like acyclovir, indinivir, sulfadiazine, and amoxicillin. Okay, guys, what can look like and smell like AKI is obviously CKD in the right setting, right? And a rise in creatinine without kidney injury due to medications like trimethoprim, cymetidine. There could be a rise in the urea due to gastrointestinal bleeding, protein loading, or use of steroids. Peripheral edema, hematuria, or hypertension suggest glomerular nephritis. Rash may suggest vasculitis, arteriembolic disease, or acute interstitial nephritis due to medications. Malignant hypertension may indeed suggest renal artery stenosis, glomerular nephritis, or vasculitis. How do we go about evaluating these patients? So as always the case in medicine, we've got to take a good history and do a good examination, all right? Data history for comorbidities, especially hypertension, diabetes, HIV, symptoms that we alluded to already. What medication does the patient use? Are there any toxins the patient has been exposed to? Any recent infections? Then physical examination, especially with regard to volume status and skin exam. Right? And then we want to assess the urine output. So if the patient is anuric, right? That basically means that they are passing less than 100 mls per 24 hours, and that suggests obstruction, severe intrinsic injury, or renal artery occlusion. Oliguria means that the patient is passing between 1 to 400 mls per day. That suggests prerenal disease, hepaturenal syndrome, or significant intrinsic injury. Non-oliguria means the patient is passing more than 400 mls per day, and that strongly speaks to intrinsic renal disease. Elevated urea and creatinine, as we already know, are hallmarks of acute kidney injury, but do not always accurately reflect the glomerular filtration rate. 
Now, the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate, in milliliters per minute per square meter, is most commonly estimated by the MDRD equation, which is modification of diet and renal disease equation. But there's a recent one, which is called the CKD EPI, which also has been shown in, as a reliable indicator of the GFR. So the GFR can only be estimated under steady state conditions, right? We're going to evaluate for electrolyte abnormalities that keep company with AKI, the likes of hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia, which are relatively common. You want to assess your liver function test and your creatinine kinase levels. Your flow full blood count may reveal anemia, which could be microangiopathic, chemolytic, or immune-related. Thrombocytopenia, example with HUS and TTP or DIC. Eosinophilia, in the way of interstitial nephritis, arteroembolic disease, and vasculitis. Urinalysis and microscopic evaluation of the urine sediment assist in the differential diagnosis. Bland sediment typically occurs in pre-renal and post-renal AKI. In patients who have oliguric AKI, which means they are passing 400 mls or less per 24 hours, who are not in diuretics, the fraction excretion of sodium may distinguish pre-renal AKI, in which case it is less than 1%, from acute tubular injury, in which case it is more than 2%. How do we compute the fraction excretion of sodium, the FINA? You take your urine sodium, divided by the plasma sodium, multiply it by the plasma creatinine, divided by the urea creat uh, urine creatinine, and you multiply it by 100 to get a percentage. In patients on diuretics, we have to calculate the fraction excretion of urea instead, right? You want to assess renal size and exclude obstruction by renal ultrasound. Renal biopsy is sometimes indicated, all right? Guys, how do we treat and manage AKI? So prevention includes adequate intravascular volume, especially the patient's NPO, and hydration given 24 hours before and after you give contrast. And this was minimized contrast nephropathy in those patients who are high risk. Treatment is based on etiology and is often supportive. You want to place a Foley's catheter to rule out urethral or bladder obstruction. You want to monitor your urine output, right? Correct volume and electrolyte abnormalities and optimize your hemodynamics. Patients with volume depletion will require IV fluids. Loop diuretics for those who have decompensated congestive cardiac failure. Patients with hyperkalemia require immediate treatment and cardiac monitoring. Bicarb administration may be necessary to treat severe acidemia. All right. Adjust your drug dosing, especially your antibiotics to insulin and to toxin, according to the estimated glomerular filtration rate. Discontinue all your nephrotoxic drugs. This is most important. Your non steroidals your immunoglycosides, your ACE inhibitors, your drugs which have an association with interstitial nephritis like penicillins, kephalosporin. So good to do an analysis of the patient's drug chart. Now, hemodialysis is indicated for... Symptomatic uremia in the way of encephalopathy or pericardial drug, fluid overload unresponsive to diuresis, serum electrolyte and acid based abnormalities that are refractory to standard measures, example severe hyperkalemia or acidosis. Dialysis is also indicated for symptomatic poisoning by toxins that are dialyzable, like lithium, ethylene glycol, and methanol. Dopamine and mannitol have little role in the management of AKI. So this is, in a nutshell, the management of AKI, right? So we already addressed most of these. We speak about general issues and specific issues. General issues is optimization of systemic and renal hemodynamics through volume resus and judicious use of vasopressors. Eliminate your nephrotoxic agents. Initiate renal replacement when indicated. Specific issues are nephrotoxin-related. Address your volume overload, your hyponatremia, your hyperkalemia, or metabolic acidosis, your hyperphosphatemia, your hypocalcemia, hypermagnesemia, hyperuricemia, nutrition, and drug dosing, all right? Guys, in terms of prognostication and complications, the estimated overall mortality associated with acute kidney injury is 15% if community acquired and up to 30% if hospital acquired. Mortality may even be as high as 75% for patients in the ICU. Early nephrology consultation has been shown unequivocally to improve outcomes. Pre-renal AKI is generally reversible if uh, recognized and treated appropriately and promptly. Non-oliguric AKI has a much better prognosis than does oliguric. However, using diuretics to convert an oliguric state to a non-oliguric state does not affect the original prognosis. Acute tubular injury usually resolves within three weeks and rarely the injury progresses to permanent and end-stage renal disease. Contrast nephropathy often resolves within three to seven days. Patients at highest risk are those who have concomitant diabetes, chronic kidney disease, intravascular volume depletion, or myeloma. So guys, coming back to our clinical case, just to rehash the stem of the question,
We said we've got a 54-year-old male who is admitted to the medical ICU with sepsis associated with pneumococcal pneumonia. He requires mechanical ventilation and adrenaline to maintain his MAP above 60. Invasive hemodynamics shows adequate left half filling pressures and there's no LV dysfunction. On the third hospital day, his urine output's coming down, his creatinine is going up to 220 micromole per liter. Acute tubular injury is diagnosed. Which of the following agents has been demonstrated to improve outcomes associated with his acute tubular injury? And the answer is dum 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 Nothing. Luto. Nada. None of the above. So AKI, as we know, is a poor prognostic indicator in patients in the ICU and has been shown in multiple types of ICUs for multiple medical conditions. Unfortunately, care of critically ill patients with AKI is merely supportive because no specific therapy has been demonstrated to improve outcomes. Okay, I hope you will allow me to just encourage you from the Bible. We're talking about love today. John 13, 34 says, A new command I give you that you should love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you too should love one another. First John 4, 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Indeed, we are called to love one another as God has loved us. And I pray that we will be kind, considerate, and compassionate, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with your kids, whether it's with your colleagues and your friends, whether it's with strangers. I pray that we will show love. Here are my references. You can catch me on Facebook. Just, just search for my page, which is entitled Internal Medicine, Algorithms and Mnemonics, <coughs> excuse me, you can also catch me on Instagram and on TikTok as well. God bless you. If you enjoyed this material, I encourage you to like, share and subscribe. Thank you so much for joining me. We're going to be talking congestive cardiac failure soon. Looking forward to that one. All the best and take care.